dispensational studies wrapping up the church age. And so we are looking at the letters to the churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. <coughs> Excuse me. So quick by way of review, um, we're talking about the church age. That's what Revelation 2 and 3 covers. How do we know that? Um, going back to chapter 1, verse 19. The Lord tells John, write the things which thou hast seen. Well, these are, that's what's already been written down. Then he says, and the things which are, that's the things of this time, and then the things which shall be hereafter. How do we know when the hereafter starts? Well, turn to chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. That's where the hereafter starts. So chapters 2 and 3 deal with our dispensation, the things that are. They're letters to seven churches. There are seven real churches that had real problems that the Lord was addressing. I believe the term angel within these letters is referring to the pastors of those churches, because these are instructions to the churches themselves, the people of the churches and their leadership. Um, angel is just a word that means messenger. Okay, it's often referring to angelic beings, spiritual beings from heaven. But that's not its only use. That's the only way we use it. Okay, um, just like the only way we use church is to talk about a body of believers. Okay, but that's not the only use of the word church in the Bible. It's any called out assembly, including, for instance, uh, our county commissioners. They're a called out assembly to make decisions for the county. Okay, and it was used politically that way in the Greek world. We use it to refer specifically to this within our language. And angels, we use the term to talk about heavenly spirits. But it just means messenger. And in this particular case, I think it's clear he's talking to the pastors of the churches. He gives in certain instructions. Remember that we looked before we move on that uh, verse 3 of chapter 1 says, Blessed is he that readeth. And they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. That tells us several things, but the main thing it tells us is that Revelation is not a closed book. It's a book we can understand. And we're supposed to study it. That's what this tells us. Understand it and keep those things that are in it. Believe them. And live as if they're true. And so we can't do that if we couldn't understand it. If Revelation was a closed book or a book that's impossible to understand, God wouldn't tell you this. Okay, but he does. The Lord, of course, is revealed in the book of Revelation. The revelation referred to in the book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ as God in the flesh. That's the point of the book. There's a lot more to the book than that, but that's the theme. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It reveals to the whole world who he is. And when he returns, of course, they're all going to see him. Now, there'll be no question who he is. Okay, people now, they can say whatever they want. But in the end, when the Lord comes back, there will be no arguing with him or about who he is. Um, we see in our world today, as, as Brother Grant alluded to, and it is very distressing, we see this chaos and insanity and just lies, absolute slanders going on all the time, um, all the time. And this is the, some of the craziest stuff I've ever seen. And none of that is going to go on in the kingdom. None of it. The Lord will rule with a rod of iron. It will be clean. It will be clear. It will be right. Amen. And that's going to be something. Man will get a perfect world. And then he'll rebel against it because he'll hate it. That's just how these things work, I guess. Sinners are sinners. Well, we looked at these letters. So the first thing on these letters is, I'm going to cover it fast so we can get to the last two. Uh, the first thing is, they're letters to seven very specific, very real churches that existed in Asia Minor, which is we call Turkey today, um, at the time of the writing. They're, they're written to address specific problems within those churches. That is the interpretation, and that's accurate. There are, however, three applications that are separate from that. One is each church, each real church, ought to examine itself against these letters to see where it stands and to make whatever corrections are necessary so our candlestick doesn't get taken away. Amen. Remember, the Lord threatened to do that. And he says in the first chapter what the candlesticks are. They're the churches. If the candlestick is removed, the people might still meet in the building and call themselves a church, but they're not a church anymore. They're no longer a temple of the Holy Ghost. Right. Okay, and so we want to avoid that. And so we can use these letters to examine ourselves, our own church. 
Uh, second thing is, in each one of these letters are instructions to individuals within the church. In other words, things that individuals ought to do to help the church or, in the case of the last letter, to separate themselves from it. As individuals, we ought to examine ourselves and see if we're doing these things as we should. It talks, he, he speaks over and over again about him that overcometh. He's talking about faithful believers. It's not about salvation. Okay? Um, there are, within some churches, there are unbelievers. But that's not what he's talking about here. Because remember these, le- the, I'll get to that in a moment. He's, he's talking about serving faithfully and what the results will be at the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? And then the last thing is these letters cover some time periods that stretch throughout church history. There are people who say that can't be true because the rapture is imminent. It's at hand, which means it could happen at any moment, which is true. We saw that in the verse 3 that we read in chapter 1. The time is at hand, right? Uh, However, simply because these time periods have taken so long doesn't mean they had to. These events could have occurred in a very much shorter period of time or almost no time at all had that been God's plan. So the fact that these letters actually address time periods in church history, and I believe they do. I believe prophetically they do. And that's based on the things that are and the things that shall be hereafter. Okay? Um, That doesn't mean that the rapture wasn't imminent. It's always been imminent. And all imminent means is there isn't a prophetic event that must occur before that happens. It's the next prophetic event on God's calendar. That doesn't mean other things can't happen. We know from Ezekiel that God gathered the Jews in an unsaved condition back into Israel. The Valley of Dry Bones. That's been done, right? But it didn't have to be done prior to the rapture. But it was. So the next event we know that will occur on God's prophetic calendar is the rapture. Now, we've gone through all of these letters until the letter to Philadelphia, which is in verse 7 of chapter 3. There it says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. This is what it means to be reading the revelation of Jesus Christ. Each of these descriptions is about him. They're truths about him. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength. Notice, he doesn't say they're they're strong. He says, thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now remember, we've already talked about what churches are. They've got to have the proper leadership, pastors and deacons and so on. And we've already covered all that. These are letters to churches, not the church. Right? Everyone remembers that. We use the term the church in an institutional sense, but there is no such thing as a worldwide church. There are churches. Okay? And so he's written these letters. And this particular one, he has no rebuke to make of Philadelphia. This church, he does not rebuke. He doesn't give them all the same credit he gave to Ephesus. Did you notice that? Church in Ephesus, he said much better things about before he rebuked them. And so what is this about? Well, if you have a Schofield Bible, he tells you it's the true church within the the church. In other words, the true believers within, in Schofield's mind, the universal invisible church, or the, 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 uh, what do you call it, Uh, Christendom, the kingdom of heaven. I agree, but not exactly. So what I think this is referring to is an actual time frame, and it's the missions age, okay, which began sometime in the late 1500s, and then the King James Bible came out in 1611 and so on, and ran really effectively until about 1920. I think that's, you know, we can quibble on exactly when it ended, but that's, these things are 
rough anyway. But I think that's the, the window, 1600 to 1900 roughly. What happened in that time period? Well, <clears throat> the greatest missions work that's ever been done on the face of the earth was done over those 300 years. More souls were saved, more churches were planted, more Bibles were printed, more missionaries went out, more money was spent, more gospel was preached worldwide than ever has had happened before. And it's not even close. Tens of millions of saved people Amen. in that window. We still send out missionaries, but it's nothing like it was back then. It's not even close. And so I think it's really talking about that time period. Um, now, of course, there are a lot of unbelievers still and other things going on, but uh, that clearly was a time blessed by God for the saving of millions of souls and the planting of thousands and thousands of churches all over the world. Okay? Um, in that time period, that was the imperial age, you know, the, the Europeans basically enforced their will as far as a legal matter all over the world. And that opened the door to missions. I mean, you don't get missionaries into India if England doesn't run the place. But England did run the place. And so lots of missionaries got into India. And that happened all over the world. I mean, there's millions of people who will be in heaven because of that. Okay? And then we get to the last letter, which is the age we are in. The message to Laodicea. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Well, that's not good. He doesn't have anything positive yet. And in fact, there's nothing positive to say to this church. It's all harsh. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. So I'll pause there. So what is he saying? He's describing a condition. These are churches, or a church at least in this case, that believed it didn't have need of anything. It had everything it needed. But it was looking at it from a worldly standpoint, not a godly one, not a heavenly one, not a spiritual one. It was thinking in a fleshly, worldly way. This is like our modern churches. I mean, think about it. I know that there are churches that are faithful, but so many of our churches are about numbers. They're about money. They're about size. And I'm, just, I'm talking about the fundamental churches. If you get into the evangelical and charismatic movements, it's all like this. That's all they're about. Do you think Joel Osteen cares one bit about whether a specific person in his church is faithful to the Lord or not? No, he cares about the ten to 15,000 people he gets in each time and the amount they tithe. Right. I know I'm being harsh about it, but I believe that. I believe he's one of those that serves his belly. Sure. He makes merchandise of God's people. And I base that on, re on listening to his sermons. Not, and I haven't listened to that many, but enough. Okay. Um, this Laodicean age is, I believe, the age we're in. It's the age of the great falling away. We're going to look at that issue here in a moment and combine it with this. But Now, the Lord gives them some counsel. I believe that, the, that this church in Laodicea, I believe, I have no reason to believe it except that I just do. I think it probably took this counsel and did this at the time. As I said before, all these churches are gone now, so it doesn't matter. Um, but he says to them, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. So he's speaking here of spiritual things. We know from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the things that survive the fire are gold, silver, and precious stones. Those are the things that God does through us in our church. So he's talking there about submitting to the Spirit of God in the work in the church. He talks about the raiment. Well, we know from another passage later in Revelation that white raiment refers to the righteousness of the saints. And there it's referring specifically to the church. We'll get to that at a later time. But it's referring to the church age believers and their clothing. That's what we wear in heaven, white robes, which reflects the righteousness of the saints. What does that mean? Well, there's twofold, two pieces to that. One is it's the righteousness of Christ, the result of faith. But second, it's also righteous living. 
It's the saints living out what Christ wants us to be. And then last, he says, I self. What does that have to do with? Well, they were blind. He tells them that. You're wretched and blind. They weren't paying attention to what really mattered. Their eyes were on the worldly things instead of on the things of God. So he's saying, open your eyes, put your eyes where they belong, on my things. <clears throat> and then look at verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. The Lord loves you. He's going to chasten you. How many of you have ever been in the wrong place with the Lord and, and felt his displeasure inside and in your daily life? And you just feel it's like a darkness hanging over you. I have. And it's not a pleasant way to feel. In fact, it feels so bad that it forces me to change what I, where I am because it makes me so unhappy. I can't be, the things that in life that I want to enjoy, I can't enjoy when I have that feeling over me. Right? That's the Holy Spirit. That's not me. I'm telling you, my, my flesh would, couldn't care less. Okay, that's God. And so he does that because he loves me. He does that to all of us because he loves us. And he loves our church as a church. Amen. And he wants the church to be sound. And so he corrects it. He rebukes it. And he chastens it in an attempt to turn it around. Okay? Now, we know, and we're going to look here in a moment, that in this age, that's simply not going to happen. There will be faithful churches up to the point of the rapture, but not very many. Christendom, the kingdom of heaven, which includes all professing Christians, whether they're saved or lost, that's going bad. And it's just going to go bad and get worse until the end. Okay? And that's what this age he's referring to here is. The end here, he, he says something. Now, these three verses are often used as uh, salvation passages. It's not really about salvation. That's not an improper use. That's an, that's an okay application. But he's not talking here about salvation. He's speaking to individual church members in the Laodicean age. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. What door is he talking about? Door of the church. These churches have kicked him out. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And so what is he saying there? Well, if the church really wants the Lord in, he's ready to come in. Amen. They've got to be zealous and repent. Let him in. Let him have his way. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And so he's telling churches, if you want, you know, if you'll open the door, in I will come. I would add, if a church won't do that, and you're in that kind of a church, I think you have an obligation to leave. Amen. I don't like that. You know, I mean, let's be honest. The church at Corinth, <laughs> that church had all kinds of trouble. But it wasn't as bad as this. This is a church that's dead, spiritually dead. And it's only about the things of the world. You cannot grow in that, and you can't serve God in it. It's not his church. There's no candlestick there. You've got to get out if it won't repent. Yeah, you've got to separate yourself. So those are the, the, the letters to the churches. Now, let's look quickly at some other passages to help us see this age. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Now, we're talking here, these letters, of course, this is church age truth. These are things that were revealed so that our age could have instruction. So they're to us, about us, and for us. Okay? Old Testament wasn't to us or about us, but it's for us. This is all three. It's to us, it's about us, and it's for us. Okay? So 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, speaketh expressly. In other words, he says clearly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Now the latter times refers to our dispensation, the end of it, as it gets towards the end. And what does it say? giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And then he gives some examples, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Many people assign this to the Catholics, and that's fine. They forbid their priests to marry. And for a while, they didn't let people eat meat on Friday. And they would have, and during Lent, people won't eat meat and things like that. Um, 
but it's, it's broader than that. Seventh-day Adventists believe in being vegetarian, right? The Shakers, of course, and they didn't marry. They called themselves Christians, right? This is, I don't think we've seen this thing manifest itself yet in its fullness. I think this is a bad, heretical outgrowth that's going to appear soon and will be probably well accepted broadly by quite a few people. In any event, it's talking about the latter times. Now, if you remember, when we were talking about these letters to the churches, <clears throat> in the one to Philadelphia, the Lord said something. Um, he said in verse 11, Behold, I come quickly. Now, he wrote that almost 2,000 years ago. So did he mean it? Of course. Every word God says, he means absolutely clearly. And so what did he mean? He, he meant simply, my return is the next, it's imminent, it's at hand, it's the next thing on God's calendar. Now, it hasn't happened. That doesn't mean it won't happen, and it certainly doesn't mean it won't be quickly. The, the Bible tells us God's going to make a short work on the earth. This earth's only been around for a little over 6,000 years. It's only got about another 1,500 years at most, I would guess. I could be wrong about that, but I think at best about 1,500 more years before the whole place is going to get burned up and rebuilt. It's not going to last that long. So quickly is, you know, soon. And it is soon, no matter how it looks to us. Um, but there are those, of course, who, will, you know, they would say, well, you can't have, those churches can't be, re those letters can't be referring to time periods because of the imminency of the rapture. Nevertheless, he gave that instruction to Philadelphia, which is clearly to a church in Philadelphia. He says, I'm coming quickly. Well, it's the same issue. And so that argument that those letters couldn't refer to the time period, it does not hold water. Right. Based just on the words within the passages themselves. Okay? So, um, now, back, we see it when he talks about latter times, he's writing to a church. So he's talking about the end of our age, the latter times of our age. Times I think we're in. Now turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul says, I charge thee therefore before God. What is the therefore therefore? Well, you look back, of course, it's the, the verses right before in chapter 3. Remember, there's no chapter and verses in the original. He was talking about Scripture and that it provided everything you needed to be complete. You don't need a second blessing. There is no second blessing. But even if there were, you wouldn't need it. The Bible says you don't. It says you've got all you need in Scripture. He says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, notice, at his appearing and his kingdom. People often read over that and just say, well, that's the same thing. It's, they're not the same thing. His appearing is the rapture. His kingdom is his return. Okay? And both of them, there will be judgments. Then he says in verse 2, preach the word, be instant. That means consistent, regular, immediate. In season, out of season. It doesn't matter if you think the timing's bad. Even if it's out of season, do it anyway. You know, sometimes we wait for a good moment to talk to someone about, about the Lord or whatever. I'm not telling you to violate your plans or those things, but I'm telling you it's always the right season. Okay? It's always the right time because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. The Bible says now is the appointed time. Today is the day of salvation. Okay, and so here he says, don't, don't not talk about it. Whether you think it's out of season, do it. Instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Doctrine is a dirty word among today's La Laodicean church, but not in a real church. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And that will means they choose not to. They will not to. They're going to shut their ears to it. But after their own lusts, you see that? It's sin that drives this. After their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth. Notice they're turning their own ears away. They're choosing to shut their ears and turn away from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now, we've seen all kinds of just 
I mean, we, we see, of course, the big churches with the false teachers and the false preachers and all the TV ministries and the cable ministries and all that. How many of you saw what happened with Mr. Falwell this weekend or this last week? Terrible, terrible situation. He's a fundamental Baptist, or at least that's his presentation. Um, that's just terrible. Well, it, I mean, where, does the, where do these things come from? <laughs> right here, right? Am I any better than Jerry Falwell Jr.? I am not. Neither is anyone else. This is why he says here, he warns pastors, I charge thee, he's writing to Timothy, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, preach the word, be instant, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. We need our pastors to do that. We can't effectively grow and protect ourselves from sin on our own. We can't do it. You can't do it. You need the word of God both through your own study and through the, the medium of a preacher and a teacher's. That's why they're here. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians that he gave us these pastors and teachers and so on for the perfecting of the saints. That means the maturing of them, the completion of them. Okay? And so we need that. And unfortunately, we've reached a time where the lusts of the human heart, which he talks about here, after their own lusts, shall they heed for themselves teachers, the lusts of, our, of their own hearts have caused them to not endure sound doctrine, turn their ears away from the truth, and to follow fables. Now, I like President Trump, I'm, I, you know, but the fact is, I like him as a president. I don't like him as some sort of important spiritual leader because he's not. He's the president. I like him as a president, especially given our options, right? I mean, I, there are things about President Trump I don't like. Okay, but, but the, the point on that is, I know that in Falwell's case, that was really the focus of what he had been doing over the last few years. It was, it was very political. That is not what we should be about. I'm gonna vote for the president, I am, and I'm not voting for a Democrat ever. I'll cut my hand off before I do that. That party has sold us out. And so I'm not gonna have anything to do with them. You vote for who you want, that's your business. I'm just talking about myself. But having said that, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on politics because that's not what God has for us. We're, about, we're supposed to be about this book Amen. And, and getting people the gospel. And so we need to focus on that. And that's what this, these two passages in 1 and 2 Timothy refer to the same era that we're in now. The time will come, the latter days. That's the Laodicean age. That's the age we're in. You can't trust just because someone says he's a Christian on TV or so on that he is. I do think there are, are people who are saved among the evangelical world. I, I don't doubt that. In fact, I think there are probably quite a few of them. I believe that Franklin Graham is saved. I think he's a heretic and makes terrible mistakes and is involved in things he shouldn't be, politics and all that. But I'm going to tell you, I've heard him talk. And he gives the gospel in a way his father never did. I mean, right to reporters and politicians, and he gets it in there. And he doesn't back down on things either, like Islam or homosexuality or anything. He just stands firm on it. I think that manifests a man who's truly born again, just confused about some things. So I, I'm not trying to be mean about new evangelicals or everyone out there. I'm really not. Um, but... They're not part of our church. We need to be focused on our church. Amen. We need to be focused on seeing souls saved here, churches planted around us, and do our part uh, until the Lord comes. And that is the next topic, the rapture. So that is, going back to Revelation, verse, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, you see the rapture here. So he's gotten these letters to the churches. Those are the things that are. Remember the verse, verse 19 in chapter 1? These are the things that are. And he's finished that. Now he's going to talk about things that are, shall be hereafter. So verse 1, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will shew thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat 
was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So who's that sitting on the throne? That's Lord Jesus, right? This is, the, again, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So this is, John's vision is, gives us here a type of the rapture. He's talked about the church age, and then he's raptured into heaven. And you do not see the word church again in the book of Revelation until chapter 22, verse 16. So turn there. And when you see this, notice... This is the Lord speaking about the whole book. And what does he say? I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. That's the next time you see the word. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. That's not referring to the water of life in heaven, the, the river. Look at the context. This is the Lord referring to the book he just dictated to John, or had an angel dictate. And he's saying, I sent the angel to give these things, to give this information to the churches. Now, all of you out there, if you want the water of life, come. He's talking about getting saved. Okay? That's a real salvation passage you can use. When it says, whosoever will, that's, that's a whosoever will salvation. That is the context. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God, and so on. That is, that's the wrap-up of Revelation, and I believe the whole Bible. So, we don't see the church again in the book of Revelation until you, you do actually see it before that. You don't see the word before that. Um, turn back to Revelation 19, verse 7. It says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. That's the church. And this is, we'll get to it a little later, this is the second coming. This is after the judgment seat of Christ, the church is ready to go, the Lord's coming back, and we're coming with him. It's a, this is one of the most exciting chapters in the whole Bible, is chapter 19. But this here, this wife that's being referred to is the church. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And so that is the next time you see the church, even though it's not called the church there. It's the church in general assembly. It's all the people in heaven from this age. Um, but that's the next time you see them. And then we all come back with the Lord. Verse 11, and I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and so on. And he's coming down. Look at verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. So we know who that is. He's just told us who that is. That's the wife, his bride. So the rest of Revelation is about Israel and the Gentile world kingdoms and God's judgments on them. We're going to cover some of that later. I'm not going to go through Revelation in any kind of depth or detail. I'm going to cover some things out of it. I'm going to spend... I mean, we're actually looking more at Daniel in detail than we are at Revelation, but we are going to cross-reference the passages so you can see them both. But I'm not going to go through all of the seals and the trumpets and all that stuff. Notice this, the last trump referred to in 1 Corinthians is not a trumpet in Revelation. It's the voice that sounded like a trumpet in Revelation 4.1 when he said, come up hither. Okay, and so what do we know about the rapture? Well, we know some things. Turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14 occurs at the Last Supper. What do we know has been going on by the time the Lord gets to the Last Supper? Has he been rejected by Israel? Yes. We saw in Matthew that he got rejected by Israel well before the Last Supper. He's already turned his attention now to drawing individuals out of Israel and preparing his disciples for a church age. He's already done that. And so in John chapter 14, he's talking to them in verse 1. That by the way, this was my father R.C.'s favorite passage in the Bible. These verses we're going to read right here. Without a doubt, his favorite. Let not your heart be troubled. By the way, I, I hear, I don't listen to him very often because I can't stand Sean Hannity. But he says this every night at the end of his show. That's... It just makes my skin crawl. 
because he's talking about politics and worldly stuff. The Lord wasn't. The Lord was saying it doesn't matter how things look. Trust me. So he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Think about that. He's been doing that for you for 2,000 years now. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Notice, he doesn't say I'll come again and establish a kingdom. He says, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. This is the first mention of the rapture. Okay? So the Lord told the disciples, once I go away, don't worry. I'm going to come back and get you and take you to where I am. That's not the same thing as the second coming. The second coming is when he returns to earth to establish his kingdom. Now, some people say well, the second coming occurs in two parts, and there's truth to that. The rapture is part of that, I guess. But I, I prefer to keep them distinct. The rapture is an event for the church, age, believers. The second coming is when the Lord comes back to earth to establish a kingdom. Okay? And so... This is the first mention of it. And then we get, turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. I'm moving fast through this. Um, this, by the way, is in dispensational studies. These are the things that people like the most. The prophetic events and seeing how they fit together. And that's exciting stuff. It is. I like it too. I, I don't know anyone that doesn't, that's a Bible believer. But I'll tell you, the real value of dispensationalism is keeping you from falling into false doctrine. That's the real value of it. So that you don't mix law and grace. So that you don't try to live under the law of Moses. So that you, you know what your job is as a church. So you don't get messed up about what the church is and what it isn't. That's its real value. It's so that we have good doctrine so that we can do the right things here. But seeing these future things is super exciting. Amen. And it helps you with that too. So verse 51, Paul writes to the church at Corinth, Behold, I shew you a mystery. Now, we've talked before. What's a mystery? Well, it's something that had not been revealed before, but now God's revealed it, and so now I'm going to tell you about it. We shall not all sleep. In here, we know that when, by sleep, he means believers passing on. Right. Believers don't die. They sleep. Now, by sleep, he doesn't mean soul sleep. The spirit and soul go to be with the Lord. The body sleeps in the earth until it's resurrected, and that's the reference he's making. Jesus referred to... Um, Lazarus as being asleep. Disciples didn't understand him. Okay, and that's what he's talking about here. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So now he's explaining something about the rapture, about the Lord coming back to get his saints, that even Jesus didn't tell them in John 14. And that thing he's telling them is that those that had passed away and those that are still alive all get taken up together at one time. That's what he's referring to here. And so he says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, that's the last trump of this age, of this dispensation. Remember, this is written to a church in our time. Okay? For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's emphasizing there that death is not death for the believer. We've passed from death unto life. Christ has, has dealt with that. Therefore, now because we know this is going to happen, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So, we know that these two, those that have fallen asleep and those that are still alive, not everyone's going to die, everyone's going to get changed. That's what he teaches them here. Now, turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look at verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Okay, are we supposed to be ignorant or are we supposed to listen to this and know about it? We're supposed to know about it, right? I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. 
Those are the believers that have already passed on. Remember, this is written to the church at Thessalonica. This is a church age letter. This is to us. It's for us. It's about us. Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. He doesn't mean we don't feel sorrow when people die, but we don't sorrow like others, because it is not hopeless. We have hope well, for believers who've passed on. If you have loved ones that were unbelievers, well, they're gone. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So when the Lord comes back to rapture us out, he's bringing those, those souls and spirits that went to be with him. Paul says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. They return with him. <laughs> For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. That means we will not precede them. We won't go ahead of them. Okay? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. These are church-age saints. Those that have died since Christ was resurrected after the, the crucifixion. So, they rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. We all go up together. They rise out of the graves, and then we all, boom, gone. To go be with the Lord in the clouds. We're caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So this is, if you put it together with John 14, with Revelation chapter 4, those three verses come up hither. And then, of course, uh, the passage we saw in 1 Corinthians. We're all, we'll all be changed. Whether you've slept or not, you're, you get your new body right here. Okay? And we all go up together. They don't head up to the air first and then we follow. They come out of the graves with their new bodies. Our bodies get changed in the twinkling of an eye. And then we all go up together to meet the Lord in the air. Notice that. He's not coming to the ground here. He's coming to take us out of here. Amen. Chapter 5 says, But of the times and seasons, brethren, remember there's no chapters and verses in the own, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. No one's going to be able to pin down the exact time. No one. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. He's referring to the tribulation period. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. He doesn't mean you'll know when it's going to happen with any kind of exactitude. He simply means you should know the signs of the times and be prepared. Lift up your eyes. Okay, be ready. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. That ties in with pastor's teaching this last week. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's telling us, we're not going into that wrathful time period. That's for those that are, are not saved. For us, we're taken out of it before it comes. Another type in the Old Testament of that is Enoch, being translated out before the flood came. He's a type of the church. Noah and his family is a type of Israel. They have to go through the flood where they'll get straightened out. And then the last passage we'll look at, and then we'll be done, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Apparently, so because of the first letter he wrote, some of the people in the church at Thessalonica, and who, you know, can't blame them. They didn't have all the, this information. Um, some of them thought this might have already started happening and that they'd missed it. They got scared. So he sent them 2 Thessalonians, and in that he tells them in verse 1 of chapter 2, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. Notice that? Gathering together unto him. That's the rapture. We're all pulled up together. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us. So I don't know if there if he's referring to First Thessalonians or if there was some forged letter that was claimed to be his. As that the day of Christ is at hand. In other words, that it's happened. Okay. He then says, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sit at the temple of God. Now here he's moved into the tribulation period. Okay? 
And he's talking about that. He says, sit at the temple of God, showing himself that he is of God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Well, what is it that withholds the beast or the Antichrist from being revealed? Holy Spirit. It's the only thing that can, right? I mean, he has to be the one that lets. I mean, he has to be. Nothing else could do it. He came at the beginning of the book of Acts to empower the church for a very specific mission. That's something he'd never done before. It's a ministry on earth that he's never had before and that only is during this age. The devil has been working his mystery of iniquity the whole time. And there are many antichrists out there. I think the devil always has someone ready. He just doesn't get his way and he isn't able to use them. God's still holding things back. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The he, it's a he, not an it. So he's talking there about the Holy Spirit. We believe that. And when the church leaves, the Holy Spirit in its incarnation and its empowering of the church goes with it. That doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit's not still here. He's God. He's everywhere. Just like Christ is here. He's everywhere. But Christ is meeting with us tonight as a church in a different way. And the Holy Spirit inhabits the church as a temple in a different way. And he convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment in a different way. That's a ministry given to him for this dispensation, John 17. And then he says, And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. That wicked is capitalized because it's a person and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. The beast will do all kinds of miracles. The devil can do some miracles. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. So he's talking here about people who've heard the truth before the beast is revealed. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So he's telling them there about things that are going to happen in the tribulation as a result. Um, and he's saying this has not yet happened. Don't get all upset, but it will happen. And this is why we say if you've heard the gospel and not accepted it and the rapture happens, you're lost. <coughs> You cannot repent. You'll be done. You'll be the walking dead. All right? And it's because of this passage here. Now, that was a lot of ground to cover. Um, I'm done for tonight. Uh, I expect we're going to get into the 70 weeks of Daniel and look at that next time. We'll start our study on that. It takes more than one, one lesson.